We're going to start off with this uh, presentation. Uh, you'll, you'll see a young child, and for all of you audiophiles that like, like turntables, vinyl, some of this might make you cringe, but it's my older brother, Dave. It's not Daryl. There's the disclaimer right there. Not Daryl. <laughs> I learned at an early age. So here he is as a, as a young boy in uh, Waukegan, Illinois. And uh... <laughs> I, was, I was howling when I was photographing. <laughs> It's a Ford Duke. <laughs> Take the Adrian, right? Direct disc. <laughs> yeah, directed disc, uh huh. <laughs> the LP wrecking machine. Uh, more innocent times. Yeah. More innocent times. So, but sure. before then, back in 1965, um, this was, uh, this was my setup, so uh, modular speaker, electrostatic Janssen tweeter, Bozak woofers, Bozak midrange. These were modified Ico HF89 power amplifiers. My friend Don Alley, who really, he was my early mentor in this. He went on to uh, get his engineering degree in electronics from University of California and become wealthy with a, uh, a, fact, a, a, a company that designed uh, motion control systems for conveyor belts and elevators and all that sort of stuff. Uh, this was uh, my friend Chris Reams, uh, and he went in law enforcement. <laughs> and this was an ESL tone arm and Ortofon moving coil cartridge. So March of 1974, the first Wilson Audio product, which was a SME arm on an AR turntable, and it was sold in Evanston, Illinois, by uh, Simon Zarechny at uh, Audio Consultants. There, he's still in business there. So before, uh, during uh, night, uh, the late 70s, this was, uh, uh, when I started recording pipe organs and so forth, I learned a lot about uh, large room acoustics, tonal balance, uh, recording uh, dynamic range. This is Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. And then I would bring the master tapes home and play them on the, the system which I had. And one of the things that I'd learned was it didn't sound the same. <laughs> And I love the sound of actual live acoustical music. There's just something about it. And so um, the loudspeakers really grew out of the recordings. Although I built my first loudspeaker in 1960, it wasn't very good. So this was to, uh, this was when I started to experiment. This is Daryl. And uh, this is him experimenting with the innovative channel reversal switch. Uh, and here I am building the first wham. My wonderful wife working with me. And that I think that that's an understated element of Wilson Audio. Yeah. Without that woman right there, my wonderful mom, there would be no Wilson Audio. Dave Wilson would be somewhere with a really cool tweaked out system <laughs> in a small <laughs> room that he hand built, um, but there wouldn't be Wilson Audio. Um, and so while uh, my father was the creative element in the operation, she was the business element. She's very detail oriented. And um, it's, it's been a wonderful thing to experience and to see throughout my life is my parents equally yoked as they pull forward, whether it's within the business or family stuff, they're side by side, equally yoked, moving toward uh, the end results and goals. This September, we celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary. We have 14 grandchildren. So this would become the wham. So uh, you'll notice that these modules are hung from the ceiling on aircraft wire and what that allowed me to do 
was um, as I would be sitting and listening, I, I would have my uh, calibration string attached to the module and I could pull it back and forth and you could hear how the sound would change its, its quality, its timbre. And uh, so that led to more involved investigations of it. And then finally, uh, a submittal in 1981 for a United States patent on adjustability in the time domain, which was issued in 1984. So this was uh, one of the things I learned at Grace Cathedral is uh, the importance of uh, infrasonic bass so that you can sense the size of the space that you're in. That's our daughter, Debbie. Uh, no children were hurt in the filming <laughs> of this. But this, is what, yeah. this is what we did with prototypes when we were finished with them. <laughs> Turned them into swimming pools. And so this was uh, serial number one, Wham. Our first dealer, John Garland in uh, San Jose, California. He was the Levinson dealer at that time. That serial number seven being shipped off to Paris. That serial number two. Some people have asked where some of the names come from. So for the little speaker, which would become the Watt, it was named after a little play school that the kids would go to a couple of times a week called Tiny Tots. And that was the first Tiny Tot. And it's interesting to see this because here it's being developed next to a Wham and the Alex was developed next to the new wham, which I'm working on now. Child labor at work. <laughs> we, yeah, Daryl and Debbie. Yeah, we, uh, we, we learned at an early age that um, this, if you want money, if you want to Darryl be Daryl and Debbie now, this is at the uh, Vienna State Opera House. If you want money to go out and play and buy your gummy worms and games and stuff like that, you work for it. And it was great that they provided that opportunity. Um, and. So we, we make every attempt that we can uh, to go to recording sessions and uh, rehearsals and so forth. We have close relationships with the uh, Vienna State Opera, the Vienna Philharmonic, uh, uh, Franz Velsermost, uh, the Cleveland Symphony, uh, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. That's the uh, Concerthaus in the Vienna. Um, that's front row for uh, Aida um, at the Staats Opera. And really, to, to voice a system, to, to get a system to sound real, you have to know what real sound sounds like. I mean, our favorite recordings can be nostalgic and bring us back, and, and the, you know, but it doesn't sound real. So that's a glimpse right there of uh, the very first concept prototype of the Wham. And uh, yeah, I love all the experiments from driver comparisons to solder comparisons to just the materials research, all that stuff, we listen to every element. Every piece of the enclosure has been methodically thought of and then thought of again and then thought of again. Our beloved Sabrina, Sabrina right there next mm -hmm. to uh, Sophia III. And Polaris. At, mm -hmm. at, the, uh, at the end of every development cycle, it doesn't get shifted to manufacturing until we get a thumbs up. And so it's kind of a tradition that we've, we've developed over the last decade. It's, we work on it until we both feel like, okay, that represents reality. First prototype, uh, Alexandria. You notice no swoop on the back of the crossover cover. It's, it was a, a late prototype. You know, you know what that is? Old X1 without the blades on the side, we were still lining it. And this is a great one. This is at CES when we were uh, demonstrating the effectiveness of the duet next to a boundary in a hostile environments. So after the, the many years of giving my parents ulcers, <laughs> I'm kind of making up for it in these years of uh, being able to um, be creative with them to, to help build and, and uh, keep the legacy going. I think that uh, one of the sad things that I see is companies that start out with a great vision and, and 
produce very idealistic products and they build um, fame based on, on those excellences and then they get bought out and the people that buy them out usually have different values and uh, different priorities and, and all too often what was once so special about those products is eroded away and it, and it you know, so, so often it becomes like a shell of its former self. Uh, we don't want that to happen. We, we love the people we work with. We have uh, about 50 full-time employees. Uh, over half of them have been with us for more than 10 years and uh, several over 20 years. Uh, and um, uh, we don't manufacture uh, overseas. We manufacture in Provo, Utah, the United States of America. And we want to keep Provo, do our little part to keep Provo healthy. 98% uh, of our revenues come from outside of the state of Utah. So uh, we have a uh, 43,000 square foot uh, manufacturing facility which we own. And um, uh, we, uh, and Daryl, it's gratifying to Cheryl and to me that Daryl, uh, I mean, he's lived in that family all his life and he em not only embraces, he lives those values. And, uh, and he's very resolute about that. So um, uh, anyway, I, I want to thank you for your time. But I'd also very much like to, uh, you know, any questions that you have, please. It, it makes it more interesting to everybody when, when there can be some questions. And sometimes people, you know, will hear a question and think, oh, yeah, yeah, I see that. Yeah. Yeah. Did you anticipate this type of success when you started out? It was a hobby. You know, yeah, because I, I had, uh, you know, in my schooling, uh, I, I, you know, I'd taken some electronics courses, but it didn't, it didn't capture my imagination. I built my first speaker in 1960, as I mentioned. So I loved, uh, I loved hi-fi, and I was learning more about music. Um, but, um, you know, I, I was, when, when uh, when we built that first turntable, I was doing, I was a clinical research associate for Abbott Laboratories in North Chicago. And, uh, and then when I was doing the recording in the San Francisco Bay Area, I, des I was designing medical equipment for Cutter Laboratories in Berkeley. Uh, and, and then things started happening. And then we started going to more and more shows and things like that and then working late at night and finally, my wife, who is so wise, she, she posed a real question, you know, about when do we quit the day job? That's a tough question, you know. You've got four kids. You've got a mortgage, you know. When do you quit the day job? And so my wife, who's a descendant of Charlemagne, believe it or not, she is a great risk taker. And, uh, and I'm not a descendant of Charlemagne, at least that I know of. <laughs> so it's like I'm thinking, oh my gosh. And she said, okay, look at it this way. What would it be like when we turn 50 and we don't try this and you look back and you wonder what if? And that's one you can't answer if you don't do it. And I thought about that, and of course, as you know, <laughs> when you get wise counsel from your wife, it's wise to follow it. And uh, she has been my greatest support. Yeah, so I had no idea. I had no idea, and if anybody had told me, I wouldn't have believed them. Growing up, um, one of my favorite meals that my parents cooked was called snow-capped franks. We had a lot of rice, a lot, of, and, and the snow-capped franks was mashed potatoes with cut up hot dogs in it, right? <laughs> right, and, and we lost one of our houses. As a kid, I didn't know that. I just knew we were moving, 
They uh, started the business basically with what, 10 credit cards maxed out? Yeah. Taking the leap, they dove off the cliff. Um, and so you see where real passion mm -hmm. and tenacity and, 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 a, and, a, and a solid foundation of how to do it. You know, I, I'm not a heart surgeon. If someone in here needed, you know, a surgery or something, I'd go up there and I'd give it my best. You know, I'd have good intentions to do it, but I'm not the right guy for the job, right? But it's foundation. I mean, he would, you've been building loudspeakers, you know, since you were a kid. You mm -hmm. should tell him about the first time uh, you were fooled by a loudspeaker at Christmas. Oh, yeah. Christmas 1959, um, I was this kid that I wanted a chemistry set. I wanted the kind that had potassium chloride, sulfur, and I could provide the charcoal. Now, a couple of guys are smiling knowingly, you know. My parents weren't aware of that. And so I went to bed. It was our tradition to open the presents the morning of the 25th. And I wanted to get to sleep. And these singers were outside singing Christmas carols. And they just kept doing it and singing. It's like, what? So I got up and I look out my window. There weren't any singers out there. What I realized later was that three houses up the street and through an accident of the architecture of the highway, it curved around, and on the front porch was a clip horn. And Bob Wills was playing Christmas carols for the neighborhood with a Macintosh amplifier, and it fooled me. I thought it was real. And then I ran into my dear friend Don Alley, who w had already built a speaker because he had been impressed by Bob Wills. And so, uh, and Bob Wills had gone back to Hope, Arkansas and worked directly with Paul Klipsch to build that Klipschhorn. Two years later, he, Bob decided to sell that Klipschhorn. And he knew how much I loved it. And he had gone to KLH uh, small acoustic suspension speakers. And so he made it possible for me to buy that Klipschhorn. And I loved that Klipschhorn. I absolutely loved it. It had a Stevens 15-inch woofer with a 22-pound magnet in it. And being kind of the mechanical geek that I was, I would open the door on the side of the woofer enclosure and reach in and I would take that driver out. It was a hammer tone blue color. It was massive. And I remember the first time I did it, I pulled it out, I put it on my bed, it was in my bedroom. And back in those days, it was cool to wear your watch with the face of it down, see. And I had a Longine, uh, a Wittenauer, not a Longine, I had a Wittenauer watch. And I remember reaching across and I heard this little sound. I, what, did I drop something? You know, what was that? It had pulled the hands off my watch. <laughs> <laughs> so I got some interesting stories to tell about that. Uh, yeah. So speakers are near and dear to me. I, I love transducers. I love microphones. I love speakers. I love cartridges. I, I'm, I'm one of the few guys that I actually have four tone arms with different kinds of cartridges that match different engineering characteristics of different LPs. You know, since you can't change the engineering in the LP, you play it with a different cartridge. So. Hmm. Yes, Neil. Yeah, I'm interested. You know, the father-son thing, as, as designers, do you find that you're, you're always on the same page in terms of decision-making, or occasionally you might want to go in a slightly differ, a different direction than your dad, or kind of how does, that, how does that work? We don't always agree. No. And that's okay. I think that's good. That's good, because I have less mm -hmm. experience. <laughs> and sometimes I'll throw something out, and he'll say, it's a good idea. Here's why it won't work. 
You can experiment with it if you want. Sometimes I do and come back and say, you were right. <laughs> Other times it's like, I'll take your word for it. But there are those times when, when ideas are presented, you, you know, both ways, and both of us, you know, flesh it out even more, where the sum of the ideas is greater than the initial idea presented. Um, and we have such an honest relationship and know that, and we trust each other so much that he knows that I'm not trying to sabotage him. I, I, I trust that he's not trying to hurt my feelings or anything like that. If I've got a bad idea, he'll tell me I have a bad idea. Um, and, and, and more and more, you know, we'll like, like with Alex, there are some design elements on that. Um, I'm an artist at heart. I just really wanted it to be fluid and organic and whatnot. And it's a little different than what we've done to this point. And, you know, it's like, are you, you know, you sure? It's, you know, and, and, and the feedback from the guys at the factory, I don't know about this line. And so we refine it more and more. And the end result, once again, is that, that sum of those ideas it still retains the original intention, but it's better than, than it started. And, and understanding that our goals are to uh, create the most realistic sounding systems, the most beautiful industrial art at the same time. Because I, when you're listening to the system, the ideal system is the sound stage is, is as wide as it can be, deep as it can be, as real sounding. And you see these speakers almost like, like uh, you know, statues in your room or sculptures. The sound's not really coming from the speakers. As you look at it, it's, it's almost like, a, a, like an illusion. Um, so that's the ideal right there, is that the, the creating that holograph, sonic holograph in your room where that performer can, can touch your soul, can, can emotionally stir you. And if you close your eyes, you really can almost sense that they're right there picking at that guitar. Or, you know, the symphony, you're in the hall, you can sense the, the sonic characteristics of the hall. That's the ideals that we're going for. And we know, and both of us, we want to attain the same thing. Sometimes the paths are a little different, but we always come back together because we want the same thing and we always ferret out the best ideas. So Daryl is vice president in charge of new product development for Wilson Audio. And he has done an outstanding job He's uh, been very closely uh, involved with uh, about 30 products over the last uh, decade. Yeah. yeah. And before that, working in uh, the fab shop, fabricating the enclosures. Basically, every single Watt Puppy 6, the puppy enclosure, I handcrafted those and had experience with building every other product that was you know, in the mix for the five to six years that I was working there. Worked in production, just about every wit that you know left the docks. Um, I was the uh, production supervisor during that time, and you know working through that. And, um, yeah, so it's been it's been fun having my hands in, in each each of the different areas, uh, from being a kid sweeping the parking lots to you know working in inventory, seeing all the SKUs and the parts, and um, customer service, dealer training, and then up to uh, sitting, the first product that we worked on sonically together was the Puppy 7. The Watt portion had been uh, basically done and the Puppy, he, uh, my dad was fine tuning the, the Puppy section. And um, uh, at that point, I didn't want to say anything, I just wanted to learn to observe, you know, be the apprentice. And he'd say, okay, can you hear this? Can you hear this? And we'd go plus or minus 20% on component values and then down to 1%. Can you hear this? And he would talk about it. And, and he helped me with the, 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 the jargon, the nomenclature, how to describe what I'm hearing. Um, and so it started there. And then, you know, 15 products in. Then it was more, hey, Daryl, take this element of it, fine tune it, and then, you know, bring it back and let's work on it together. Um, and then until recently, um, where he's working on, like right, right now, WAM's being developed. And while Alex was being developed, um, the final crossover, fine tuning, the voicing, Alex was sitting in the left channel of the room and the WAM is in the right channel of the room. So during the day, I was working on fine tuning the Alex. And during the night, we'd swap cables and my dad would be working on the WAM. And it was really wonderful to have the, the opportunity to be working there and, and 
And my dad was hands off. He said, you know, this is yours. You know, let's, let's see what you got, basically. And it's like, oh, that's, that's not, <laughs> it's not a tall order. What's the first part that you have felt most invested? Most invested? This, well, Alex is, I mean, this is, is this the one? Li yeah, literally, this is the one where it was hands off. I mean, the, the Alita, you know, took start to, start to finish, center start to finish, duet series two start to finish. I'm really proud of that one for what it can do, for how small it is. Uh, but uh, uh, on the flip side of that coin, Duet One, it had a great platform to jump from. And so Alex, it, you know, they're all the woofers, new technology in the woofers, and those are the same woofers in the WAM, utilizing um, the cross-flow port system that's in the XLF, uh, splitting the mid-range, you know, where the seven-inch mid-range now handles the bottom two octaves of the mid-range frequency and the upper 5.75 inch handles the top two octaves. We haven't done that before. Well, Wham, Wham has that. And Wham has been in development at that point for three years. And so I was able to uh, take what we've learned from the Wham and implement it in the Alex. Uh, so, if, but still, it's, it's a lot of weight on your shoulders. And at that time, uh, Wilson Audio needed it you know, it's development cycles and, and the marketplace all over the world, markets are suppressed and whatnot. It's, we needed something that really was a home run. I felt the, the stress on that one. <laughs> and so I, I still am, um, I don't know, it's, I don't wanna say like a dream because that's cliche, but it's still like all these years sitting around the kitchen table listening to my parents talk about business and and going to shows and helping them and you know twisting wires in the garage and you know being around it you know it, it sinks in in different ways and then all the experience in the different um, departments at Wilson Audio it was at that time uh, September uh, August September of 2015 where it was like take everything you know let's see what you got and so yeah, that was, that was the most nerve wracking. Duet, we, have, we had other products we'd launched and we were working on other things mm -hmm. at the same time. There wasn't as much stress with that one and so I had more, more time with it and whatnot. Um, so Alex, to answer your question, is the one where it's, I, that, that will be a very special product for the rest of my life. I think though that Sabrina is also a oh, wonderful yeah. success. Yeah. yeah, you did a fabulous job on yeah. that. Yeah. That speaker is the same when I go to shows and so forth. I think that's a speaker that per perhaps surprises more listeners. Yeah. They might come into a large room and they'll say, well, it's a Wilson, but boy, it's kind of small. Yeah. And more people walk out kind of shaking. It's made a lot of food. friends for us. Yeah. It really has. It's yeah. Deservedly so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, I'm sorry, go ahead. When you guys do your thumbs up and all your listening, it sounds like mostly it's live classical music that you're using in your thumbs That's, that's, uh, that's true. That's, so it's that's interesting true. interesting to me that my application, when I use, uh -huh. as you know, I have used a lot of listening speakers. Yes. And listen to a lot of other speakers. The application's totally different, different genres of music, mm -hmm. plus film production, totally different sound. Mm -hmm. set up. Why do you think that given your development process, the speakers work so well in this totally different application? What difference? Because I have no interest in tone arms and cartridges and LPs. Right. To me, that's 18th century technology. Don't even talk to me about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, kind of yeah. So, so it's a totally different mindset, but the Wilson speakers sound better than anything else that I've heard for what we do do. Yeah. So I don't know what your thoughts are. Given the way you develop and test, yeah. You don't listen to the kind of music that we listen to, but I, I would, are great for it. I, I would say that uh, if you were to design a speaker that would perfectly accurately reproduce the sound of all different types of acoustical instruments, and I'm not saying that any such speaker exists, but if you had that, and then not only the the timbres and the range, but also the dynamic range. Mm -hmm. And then you intentionally increase that dynamic range capability by at least another 10 dB. Um, and you have robust power handling capacity with it. Uh, I would submit that, that 
that would then translate into the ability to reproduce um, even music which is not acoustical music, but which is operating within the hearing range, which has textures and, you know, and, and all that. I think too that, you know, because we're very conservative about like in the crossovers, um, it's, it's typical uh, it, for inductors uh, to, uh, you know, to keep the size down, to put uh, ferrite core or other ferromagnetic material in the core. If you want a more theoretically perfect, you would go to an air core, but then it's very inefficient and they have to be enormous. And so where we do, the only places where we use any kind of ferromagnetic core is uh, the series inductor to the woofer. Okay, so what we, we use these massive, massive laminated uh, high chromium content leaves in this laminated core, and then we use 12 gauge or 10 gauge wire on it. So a measure of what an inductor will do is called saturation point. So you put a voltage into it at some frequency. So since it's for a woofer, you pick a low frequency, 30 hertz, okay? Just a little below middle C, or low C, you know, for, for a pipe organ. And then you measure the voltage that you can put into it before it takes the curve and starts flattening it, it saturates. Typically, if uh, amplifiers will typically you know, put out like 45 to 55 volts on a real, you know, slam. It's not uncommon to find um, inductors that will saturate at 50 volts at 30 hertz. Our saturates at 900 volts at, 50, at 30 hertz. So it just has that enormous overload, you know. Yeah, the headroom. Right, and then the capacitors are 600 volt capacitors. So the only things that you know, tend to break in the crossovers are the resistors, which are intentionally put in a position so you can change those without even using a soldering iron. You know? And they protect the drivers. So I think those are some of the factors. Yeah, and a system that makes a Fazioli or a Homburg Steinway Steinway sound like, or, and a synthesizer all sound the, sta the same. Or a violin sound like a viola, or you can't tell the difference between the two. Or if I was to voice the system where this is how my voice sounds. It is my voice, but it's not natural sounding. Um, and uh, live music, because we go to you know, so many performances in different halls and whatnot, we have a, a really deep understanding of what it's supposed to sound like. So if we're tuning for that, then everything else falls into line. Um, and we do throw various you know, other pop stuff and, and you know, all genres at it near the end. Just you know, what does it sound like? Um, so if that also helps answer the question, you know, if we use exclusively or primarily this type, how does it sound? good with other genres, you get it right with one, really right with one, it's the dominoes. Well, um, Mickey Hart used to be our neighbor when we were in California. And uh, his daughter Sarah and our daughter Debbie became good friends. And uh, he would invite us occasionally to go to the Grateful Dead concerts. <laughs> he would say, Dave, I don't want you and Cheryl going down into the audience down there, <laughs> you know, like the Oakland Coliseum. And during the concert, you know, you'd see all these thousands of hands like that, and sort of a purple haze going on down where Dan Healy was. So he would have us sit right behind him on the stage. So we've heard some pretty loud stuff up close. Billy Kreutzman right there, and Mickey Hart there, and Jerry Garcia, you know doing his thing. Um, but, and uh, I actually personally recorded three great drummers during, during my recording time. Eddie Graham, who recorded Hot Sticks, which is one of the great direct-to-disc recordings, uh, you know, was one of them. 
And so I know what the other types of music sound like, um, but I tend to, when I'm, when I'm voicing something, I, I tend to voice at medium levels of loudness. And, uh, and, and then to use, you know, recordings of artists that we know. I mean, a great mezzo-soprano today, her name is Alina Garancha. And we go to rehearsals and she's 10 feet away from us rehearsing. That's her voice, you know, that's, that's you know. And, and, uh, and you can't get that sitting out in an audience uh, in a concert. As a kid going to the Grateful Dead concerts was funny. My parents became very loving and protective. It was like, you know, a chicken with the chicks. <laughs> children, well, the, stay and close. the musicians <laughs> were that way about their children. Yeah. So they would have they would have these little classrooms set up yeah. behind stage, and they'd bring clowns in and food and so forth. And yeah. so the kids would be kind of protected there, which is a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think some of it is the transit. You already talked about. Yeah. But, I mean, you look at what, like, some of the metal bands are doing with the kick drums these days, or the drum kit in general. Yeah. Most people have trouble recording with the mm -hmm. drum kit. Um, it's really a ton of energy, but really, really sharp transients. Yeah. And the Wilsons can handle that. Which, yeah. So, anyway, mm -hmm. one man's opinion. You guys are going to do Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I want to, th I want to thank you for coming out. Thank you. Thank you.